Welcome to another edition of the Five Star Zone. Rico Beard, Harold Sheldon, as we get ready to break down the final four. We're down to four teams, Harold. I think two of the teams, really one team we kind of knew would be there. One team's a little bit of surprise. One team nobody saw it coming. And one team's there for the very first time ever. When you look at the path of how the four teams got there between UConn, Purdue, North Carolina State, and Alabama, I guess what stands out to you the most? It's got to be NC State, right? I mean, this is a team that was 17 and 14 entering the ACC tournament. They were playing on the first day of the ACC tournament. Tied with Louisville, who is, you know, an eight-win team with four minutes to go. And, I mean, somehow they win that. Then a couple days later, they get Virginia. They're down three, 80% shooter at the line, misses. They bank in a three to go to overtime, win that game beat Carolina to get to the tournament. All of that had to happen just to get into the NCAA tournament. And outside of the Oakland game, they pretty much controlled every game they've been in. They have you know, beat South Carolina by double digits. They went up big on Marquette and took it to Duke in the second half. So the fact that they went from 17 and 14 all the way to the Final Four is pretty amazing. And I think to put things in perspective for Big Ten fans, let's take away NC State – and insert Penn State. That's what it would be. If all of a sudden Penn State from the Big Ten that struggled all year long, that I think they had to play Michigan in the first round, an eight-win team, if Penn State went on this run, not only won the Big Ten, but then went on and would be playing in the Final Four, having to win nine games in a row to get there, that's the equivalent of what you're looking at in NC State. Now, they don't have a D.J. Burns, who's entertaining and fun to watch because you're just watching him like, man, this man should, he should not be that size and move that well, but guess what he does. And he, he has caused problems for teams. And you're right. If you're Oakland you, and you're Greg Campy, I know he's got to be sick knowing I could have beat this team. I had the ball with 10 seconds left and I threw it out of bounds and he's forever going to have to live with that. I, I think the pain eases a little bit when they when you see how far the other team made it. It makes you feel like, well, you know what? Maybe we weren't that far away. I don't know if they would have beat Duke the way that NC State beat Duke because but then again, Duke really hasn't been Duke. Like the, the real some of the, the blue bloods weren't the blue bloods this year. Then Duke wasn't Duke. Kentucky wasn't Kentucky. They Kansas just wasn't Kansas. Oh, I mean, when you when you look at the champions, like Kansas was, and then they got injuries at the end. But I think Houston kind of walked into that conference and was just like, "Oh, so this is all you need to do to win the Big 12? Right? <laughs> Y'all act like this was a big deal. We right. did it in the first year. But yeah, when you look back, the Champions Classic maybe needs to rename itself because none of the four teams in the Champion Classic made it to the Final Four this year. Um, yeah. So now I look at these teams. UConn, uh, it's been since, I think, what, Florida, the team's gone back-to-back with uh, – what was it? Yeah, Horford, Joachim Noah, yeah, Joachim Corey Noah, Brewer. You, this UConn team's playing on a different level. When they, when they played – I think – what did they play, Belmont the first game? Or – It was uh, Wagner. Or it was uh, – it was a New York school. I can't remember that. I can't remember Whoever that they played. Was. Yeah. They put the tournament on notice with the beatdown that they have. Now, I, I kind of like the cockiness and the swag of, of, of Coach Hurley when he just came out and said, look, I'm paraphrasing here, but, yeah, we, we have to blow out teams because we don't do well in close games. So, yeah, we blow teams out. Like, he doesn't try to be like, well, you know, we just go out there. No, we, we try to blow teams out because we don't do well in the close games. What, Creighton was the last time they lost? Mm-hmm. They got beat badly there. Illinois looked like they had a chance in the Elite Eight. Illinois is a team that we've covered. Illinois is a team that we all know well if you follow this podcast. And then when it was like 28 to 23 at halftime, you're like, okay, but little did you know, you were you were in the beginning of an historic 30 to nothing run. How in the world do you I, I don't even know how you stop a 30 to nothing run, but 
Harold, UConn to me just looks like a team that's on a mission that not only are we trying to win, we're embarrassing people, we're destroying people. You don't belong on this court with us. So I, I've never seen a 30 to nothing run before, especially in the Elite Eight. That's something that you might see in a 116 game if you see it at all. You know, the fact that it was 23-23 with two minutes left in the first half, and then you look up and it's 53-23. And it wasn't like you kind of hit a bunch of threes or, you know, the momentum just kind of took over. I think they only hit two threes during that whole run. Yeah. They just shut Illinois' water off. They missed 17 straight shots during the run. And it was you kind of just getting the rebound, go up, get a layup, get a dunk, another stop, rinse and repeat for pretty much eight minutes. And which makes it even more ridiculous is that those were the two best teams offensively in the country according to offensive efficiency. So the fact that they were able to get 17 straight stops against a team that was number two in the country in offensive efficiency is crazy. And there's another gear for this UConn team. They're only shooting 28% from three in the tournament. Right. So it's not, so it's not like, you know, they've just been on fire. They're just that good, that efficient, and they haven't even played their best ball yet. How is UConn this good? Like, what is it about them – because when you look at this team, you know, they, they don't have a Zach Eady. They don't have this, this guy that you're just like, oh, my God, he's going to be the number one pick in the draft. What makes UConn this, this good? So I, I read an article a couple of weeks ago. It was featuring UConn and basically how, they, how much they changed offensively. Because Danny Hurley came up with the background with that whole Hurley family pretty much. Uh, we're just going to be tougher than you. You know, we're going to fight you tooth and nail and be physical and that's how we're going to win and then you had a couple teams a couple UConn teams early that didn't do much or like they got to the tournament and got upset in the first round uh the following year they lost to Maryland in the first round and it was like you know what we need to fix some things and so to Danny Hurley's credit he wasn't an analytics guy but he hired an analytics analytics guy a guy who worked in Europe a guy who worked with the Warriors and he said look I don't know about it but why don't you tell me about it? Why don't you put me on game? And so that's basically what he did. And so if you look at their offense now, it's a lot of off ball screening. It's a lot of passing, a lot of cutting and guys are just getting open all over the place. It's not a lot of one on one. You won't see them shoot any mid range shots unless the shot clock's running down. It's layups, it's threes, and they're just super efficient at what they do. And obviously it helps to have pros. You know, I think that, you know, Tristan Newton's going to be a pro at point guard. You know, Stefan Castle is a really good freshman. Uh, they got Cam Spencer from Rutgers who's shooting 40% from three. And then you got the big fella down there in Klingon who's 7 2. And as we saw against Illinois, you know, he erases everything. And then you can still dump it into him when you can't make shots from three. And, you know, he alleviates everything. So they're, they're just really fun to watch. And I got to give him a lot of credit for adapting what he was doing before and like you said they don't win close games and they don't really need to and to his point he said you know my my mental health is a lot better when we can win these blowout games i don't have to distress worrying about it's a two-point game with four minutes left how are we going to get this done if we're up 12 with four minutes left it's a lot easier yeah so now how does alabama first trip there for nato they i mean we always say, act like you've been there before. I have never been there. They're a football school. Basketball is just something you do until the spring game. But now, all of a sudden, he's got the South in a buzz. And if I told you an SEC team was going to be in the Final Four, you would have thought any other team but Alabama? How does Bama, or does Bama even stand a chance against this UConn team? So I think, as we've seen UConn in the past, in, in their three losses, What's happened is teams have gotten hot against them from three and they've been able to control tempo and go up and down. Now, I don't know if Alabama can stop UConn from scoring because they've been one of the worst defensive teams in the, uh, at least entering the tournament, they were one of the worst defensive teams. But they get up and down. They're top 10 in tempo. You know, they're third in the country in offensive efficiency. And they just shoot nothing but threes. You know, about 47% of their shots are three pointers. They try to get between 30 and 35 and 40 attempts a game. 
And so if they're making 11, 12, I mean, we saw against Clemson, they were 16 of 36, I believe it was, from three. So their goal is to get as many threes up as possible. They're going to try to win the math. And I feel like that's the only way you can really beat UConn because UConn is so efficient on both ends of the floor that you just need to get hot from three and try to trade three for two pretty much. Now, defensively, I don't know how they deal with clinging. A lot of their bigs are pretty slight. You know, they're they're athletic, but they're not physical. And so if they get caught down in the post, I'm not really sure how they stop UConn from, from getting a bunch of layups. Yeah. Now, the other game, I think it's going to be the battle of the big men <laughs> between DJ Burns and Zach Eady. Purdue finally making it through. I, I thought it was kind of uh, a little ironic that it was Matt Painter versus Rick Barnes, two coaches who were in a club that neither wanted to be in of you can't make it to the final four. Matt Painter graduated. Rick Barnes is still there. To be honest with you, Errol, this may have been the most entertaining game to watch this entire tournament. I, I don't know, but it was just like, wow, that game to not have a dog in the fight was just fun because Neither team, I think, had a lead bigger than seven. And just when you thought one team pulled away, the other team comes back. It goes back and forth. Finally, too much Edie. You know, Dalton Connect for uh, Tennessee did everything that he could, but in the, you couldn't stop Zach Edie. And, and Tennessee, along with every other team in the tournament, got to experience what Big Ten teams have been struggling with for the last couple of years. There's just nothing you can do. You just kind of throw your hands up and say, Coach, what do you expect? Okay. For Purdue, like I said, this is going to be a two different type of big men, but I, I don't see – I mean, D.J. Burns is a, is a fun story. It's a cute story. No 11th seed has made it to the national title game. They've made it to the Final Four, but they then they get knocked out in that game. What does NC State have to do? Because to me, it kind of looks like this is just a, a UConn-Purdue matchup waiting to happen. Yeah, it seems like it's been a collision course for about the last four months. I know Houston was in that mix, too, but UConn and Purdue have been in the top three pretty much all year long. And it seems like, you know, that's the matchup that we're going to get. Um, if NC State is going to win, I don't think it'll be from Burns. I just don't see how a guy with that size going up against Zach Eady, who's 7'4", like all of the, the drop steps he was doing, all of the post moves he was doing, spinning around guys and all of that. It's a lot easier to finish on someone 6'9", 6'10", a lot harder against someone 7'4". And then on the other end, I'm just wondering how does he stay out of foul trouble? Because as we've seen, Edie's a load. You know, he's attempted 400-some free throws this year, just himself. Now, it's funny you say that. Do the referees give him an unfair advantage because he doesn't pick up fouls, but he gets a ton of fouls on him? Is is it is he just that good, or is the refs just kind of helping him out? Because I hear I hear it both ways. Yeah, I feel like he's extremely tough to officiate, um, and I get he gets fouled a lot. I think where my issue is is that he seems to use those elbows to clear out. It seems like he goes over the back to get some of these rebounds, and they're not calling those. Uh, and it was funny because I looked at the box score from a few years ago when NC State and Purdue played each other. It was like a random game in Brooklyn back in the 21-22 uh, season when Edie was a sophomore. And I laughed because he only played 17 minutes, but he had four fouls. And I was like, oh, they actually called fouls on him when he was a younger player. But it seems like they don't really do that now when you know that he's the national player of the year. He seems to get a lot more respect. I'm not sure exactly what changed there. But, I mean, it's a, it's impossible to stop. I mean, the fact that they had, what, 33 free throw attempts and Tennessee only had 11. If you're going to go into games with pretty much a plus 15, plus 20 free throw advantage, the way they shoot the ball, too, like they're just going to be really hard to beat. Yeah, I mean, you look at the sporting players for Purdue, they're starting to step up, whether it was Smith, whether it's Jones. Like, they're, they're, they're all starting to come alive and – and yeah, it's they're starting to round into that Purdue team that kind of dominated the Big Ten. Yeah, I'm curious to see what happens with them now because forever it was this, you know, the elephant in the room was you haven't made the Final Four since 1980, and 
You've had all these good teams and mm-hmm. you haven't made the final four. You haven't made the final four. All right. So now you've made the final four, but there's still that bugaboo there of we're playing another double digit seed. And throughout this whole tournament, outside of the first weekend, they hadn't played it. But if you look, they lost to a 16 seed a year ago. They lost to a 15 seed a couple of years ago. They lost to a 13 seed the year before that. So they've got the most losses against double digit seeds of anybody in the tournament. They've lost nine mm, times I to a double about that. seed. So if the game is close, if it's, you know, four point game, five point game, four minutes left, does any of that pressure kick in of, oh man, we're supposed to win this game. They don't have that home crowd that they had with them in Detroit. I just wonder how it works with NC State. You know, we're not supposed to be here. We're playing loose. Why not? You know, we're just going to keep letting it fly. I'll be curious to see if that that situation occurs, how Purdue will respond. Yeah, I think NC State's going to find out. You're going to give Purdue your best punch, but in the end, you – it's it's just hard to stop Edie. And like I said, when you got other guys, at, when, when Fletcher Lawyer is now hitting shots, and it's like, okay, he's gaining confidence. That because that's just it. If you if you double team him, Edie throws it out, and they get the open three. And if they're hitting the threes, man, that's a tough team to play. Which is kind of why I kind I want to see this game. I want to see a Purdue UConn game because I think, man, talk about just Styles making a fight. That's it right there. Between UConn's, you know, as you said, the, the cutting to the basket and Purdue, old school, we're just going to dump it down low and you can't stop this force. That would be the fun matchup to see happens. But, yeah, when I look at these final four teams, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I picked Purdue at the beginning and everybody laughed at me. Uh, you know, I still, you know, it's still like, oh, UConn is the favorite. I get it. I understand. I just think that this – Purdue may do what Virginia did, and maybe, Harold, I'll say this. If you want to make the Final Four as a one seed, you need to lose in the first round, and I guarantee you the next year, you will make the Final Four. <laughs> it's two for two. Yep. You're the numbers guy, two for two. Yep. two, for two. Virginia, they won it all. Purdue, I think, I, I do kind of think they're on a, a, a course of winning it all. I, I, I'm I'm, pick, I'm predicting the Boilermakers. I think Matt Painter, not only – he's gotten one monkey off his back. He's going to ride Zach Eady. Because Zach Eady, to me, is just the equalizer. There's nothing you can do that you can stop him. It's kind of like watching Caitlin Clark. You can't stop her threes. You could double team her. You could do whatever. She's going to hit these shots. So now you can just hope to mitigate it and hope that it, it's not as bad. Because Eady doesn't get into foul trouble. So unless he gets hurt. I, I don't see how it wouldn't be Purdue, but UConn, I'm not, it's no slight because they're just, man, they're beating the hell out of people. So I, it's silly for me to act like they have no chance because they actually do. I'm just kind of going with history and saying that, you know, you haven't seen a repeat performance. And when UConn is bad, they're bad. When they're off, man, they stink. And that's why Coach Hurley is like, we got to blow people out because I don't like playing close games we don't do well in them. So that that's just how I see it. I look at Purdue. I think that this may be the chance for the Big Ten to end that drought, end that streak. And and for the first time since MSU and Mateen Cleaves with the was the, and, and Morris Peterson was the MOP, that you may see a Big Ten team cutting down the nets or is Zach Eady just standing up and cutting down the nets. Yeah, what's I I really do want to see Purdue UConn because I want to see Clinging Eady. Like, I don't think we've seen, like, a center matchup like that on a huge stage in decades. I mean, obviously, these are not the same kind of players, but it would be similar to me on a smaller scale, obviously, of, like, a Houston Georgetown where you had just two yeah. Titans going up against each other, and neither one has seen somebody like the other. Like, Zach Eady is, you know, he's shooting over 6'9", 6'10", 6'11", guys. It's a seven-two guy who's pretty big. Like, are you going to be able to move him out of the way? And same with Klingon. Like, you've been an eraser, but it's a seven-four guy. He still can shoot over the top of you. Like, he's mm-hmm. got two inches on you. And so the fact that neither one of them have seen a guy like that, I think that would be a really, really interesting matchup. And like you said about you know Michigan State being the last time, it hasn't been for a lack of trying from the from the league. This is the fifteenth time a Big Ten team has made the Final Four since Michigan State won it. 
and seven of them have made the title game, and they've all lost. So <laughs> they keep getting to the they keep right. getting to the final stage, and for whatever reason. You know, whether it's a questionable call, whether it's a, a second half collapse like Wisconsin had or whether it was, you know, just not making enough threes like Illinois did or you know, the Florida going back to back against Greg Oden. Like there have been a lot of Big Ten teams who have gotten to that final stage and just haven't been able to, to yeah. kick the door down. So maybe yeah. produce that team. The shot, the, the, the block shot on Trey Burke that was yep. called foul. Yeah, you look at a lot of different things. And yeah. So who you got of the four? Uh, I, I'm going UConn. I think they beat Purdue. Uh, I do think it's a close one. I think I saw FanDuel had a future odds where UConn would be a five and a half point favorite if the two faced off. Uh Right now, I feel like their guards are better than Purdue's guards. So if that was the matchup, I think UConn's guards being the difference and then winning it again. All right. So one last thing, dealing with a transfer that went into the portal. And I thought it was interesting because a local team in here in the state of Michigan had interest in this kid. And I wonder, would you see this as a fit? But Bronny James entered the transfer portal. Now, I don't know what's happening at USC, but Izzo wanted him at Michigan State. Bronny James is not LeBron, just so people know. Right. Do you think it would be a good fit? Is that something MSU should try to reach out, reach out and see if they wanted to bring him there? Because in my opinion, it strictly would be a lot more for the notoriety than the actual production. Because to me, it's, he's kind of – you know, a Jay Nakins, and you kind of got a Jay Nakins. Yeah, I feel like he's more of a 3 and D guy. Um, you know, he's definitely not LeBron. I don't even think he's his younger brother, Bryce, who seems to have, like, much more athleticism in the height that his dad had. Uh, but, I mean, I think it's certainly worth the swing. They definitely need a wing more than a, than a guard at this point. I mean, we don't know what Akins is going to do, at least not publicly. Uh, so, you know, it's it's hard to to see them bring in another guard, knowing you you have fears, and you have Holloman, and if Aikens comes back, it seems like that could get pretty crowded. But you also just need talent infusion, period. Yeah. And you know, yeah, as you we saw, this kid coming Speaking exactly. Of the team, that's how long it's been. Yeah, his kid is now on the team. <laughs> exactly. So it's like they could certainly use a wing and a big. But if you have a talented player out there who's interested, I certainly think uh, it could be be worth a shot, especially because he wants to play defense. It's not a guy who's just a diva and just wants to shoot a bunch of threes. Like, he wants to lock in on defense, too. So, I mean, it's worth kicking the tires on to see the interest. Yeah, I think it's funny because it's like he may be the only kid you don't have to worry about putting together an NIL package because your NIL money is really nothing to him. Like, yeah, exactly. He's, he's – <laughs> My yeah, dad's not hurting. billion dollars, guys. <laughs> I could help you out with this. Like, to me, it's just one of those, you get LeBron wearing MSU gear. Yep. And you would actually have a kid who just wants to learn basketball. And yep. you, you would get, you know, LeBron showing up during the summer and all types of things. So I just, I thought it was funny. I, I kind of wonder if he'd take another swing at him. But because I remember when he first came out, he, he thought about it, you know, I think Ohio State was after him, but I think he I think he took a visit or yeah, I think he came up to MSU. Izzo was very interested. But yeah, I don't know what happened at USC. Everything fell apart. The coach left. Everybody's leaving. And he was the latest one to jump into the portal to leave. So just thought it was funny when I saw that. Like, wow, you could actually get him in because I was like, okay, well, you get to see him next year when they play USC, but now it's, you know, if they go after him, pursue him. You could actually see him because I don't see him going to the league. I no, no. And I think as much as it hurts dad, I think dad sees that as well. Yep. That, okay, maybe you need to go and play for a coach that's going to actually try to help you get better. Cause yeah, if not, you, you going to, you know what, here, learn some French or learn some Croatian. Cause you're going to be overseas for a long time. So I yeah, think, you know. no, I, I agree with that. Um, it was funny. I feel like he had to walk back some of his comments because I remember when he was saying, uh, you know, Bronny could 
you know, playing the league right now. As I'm looking around the league, I can see him fitting in. And then recently he was more like, oh, we got to let these kids be kids and we got to let them grow up and develop. And it's like, yeah, he, he knows his son's not ready yet. Yeah, he knows. All right. So, Harold, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on doing this final four. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, I, I think it, end, it will end up being UConn. It will end up being Purdue. We'll see what happens after that. We can wrap this thing up uh, next week. All right, sounds good. All right, man. Appreciate your time for Hale Sheldon. He's on the BTN, Senior Research Manager. I'm Rico Beard. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing to the Five Star Zone. We will be back next week.